So it's March 2nd, 2024, Saturday night at Abayagiri. And it's been snowing on and off throughout the day. It's uh, dumping snow for about an hour earlier today. It's quite nice. And so the days and nights are relentlessly passing and the winter retreat is passing by. And we do still have a good chunk of time to practice together during this precious winter retreat period. And so we've been listening to readings. This week it's been Ajahn Basano reading Wong Pao Cha, being Dharma. It's more of a mainstream title, so using consciously using the word Dharma instead of Dhamma. And there's these very, the way that Lumpur Cha teaches is, is very basic and just using everyday speech. Much of the time he's, he's not going into the details of complex Pali terminology, but he's just speaking in a very normal way and using everyday vocabulary, everyday speech. And this is incredibly useful. This is talking from his own experience. And there are, but he does throw out Pali terms from time to time, and both Lungpur Cha and many of the other Kruba Ajans use these, there's these two terms that we hear a lot in their teachings, especially if you go to Thailand, you'll hear this, Ita Rom, Anita Rom, that's in pa, that's Thai, so in Pali it's Ita Ramana and Anita Ramana, and Ita Ramana is the agreeable or the liked or the desirable and anita ramana is the disliked, the disagreeable, the not desirable. And it refers to the worldly dhammas. So there's a positive and a negative side. There's there's four pairs of worldly dhammas, sometimes known as the eight worldly winds. And that's, that's the... Uh, the uh, gain and loss, praise and blame, status, loss and status, pleasure, uh, status and loss of status, pleasure and pain. And so the positive side is of that, you know, gain, praise, status or fame, pleasure, that's the uh, seeking after that is, or the mind, the mood of, being desirous of that is ita ramana, and then the uh, trying to avoid the any sense of loss, criticism, any any sense of loss of status or reputation, any sense of pain, wanting to avoid that, wanting to get away from that. That's anita ramana. So it's a very basic and simple way of looking at our experience if we just think of ita ramana, anita ramana. And, or you could even think of it as the, the liked and the disliked, or the agreeable and the disagreeable. And that when we think about it and verbalize it, it seems ridiculous that, of course, we can't only have those good things and always avoid those bad things. And yet, the mind is trying to do this all the time. So it's important to contemplate in this way to see this in our experience, how in both coarse and subtle ways, we're just trying to seek after what is pleasant and agreeable and avoid what is unpleasant and disagreeable. Something like praise and criticism, just uh, when we get praised and if the praise is genuine, how, how wonderful is that? Or if we get criticized in something we actually did do wrong, how awful that can be. Yeah, even if it's something true or helpful, it can still feel really awful to be criticized. And uh, it can just be wonderful to be praised. Or even if we get praised and it's not true, we can still feel wonderful because then that might help our status or uh, how other people view us. So that's very ita ramana. Uh, or if we get criticized and it's not true, then we might get, we might feel hurt 
or feel like uh, start bristling, oh, how could they think that of me? And uh, we don't want to be around people who would like, who would criticize us in that way, or it's always who wants to be around somebody who criticizes us or makes fun of us or mocks us in some way or uh, kind of jokes about us or we walk into a room and people are criticizing us and this this can happen in community does happen in community so that's uh, that's very unpleasant and yet if we are to hold on to these thoughts of uh, they did this to me they thought this about me and then hold on to that that's very unwholesome unskillful and so there's that we're always kind of putting pressure the mind is always putting pressure on itself to avoid that unpleasantness and go towards that pleasantness and it, it's because of ignorance so when Lumpur Cha talks about the Buddha sitting down under the Bodhi tree he was given eight bundles of grass he was offered eight bundles of grass by a Brahmin to sit on as his seat, the Bodhi tree. And Lumpur Cha likes to see that metaphorically. He says it's, he's, he's decided he's just going to sit on those eight worldly dhammas and uh, he will sit on them and transcend them under the Bodhi tree. So to no longer be swayed by Ita Ramana and Anita Ramana, that's liberation that's the release from suffering because these things are the, like the engine that's driving the whole samsara the whole wandering on in the realm of suffering another way we could look at it is anicca dukkha anatta these three characteristics one way we can think of these three characteristics is that they are actually describing three aspects of the same thing and sometimes it can be fun to look at different translations of these. So, of course, Lumpur Cha, using that uncommon translation for Anicca, is not sure, as Maine, is not sure. Sometimes we see it translated as impermanence, or I like the translation of inconstancy or instability. Instability, because instability, then, it's also linked with Dukkha, do means off, or, or it can mean bad. Suit means good or, or uh, centered. Ka is the hub or the center of a wheel. So when a wheel is do ka, then it's wobbling. It's not true. It's, it's not centered. So we could think of dukkha as imbalance. So when things are unstable, it's the Anatalakana Sutta, monks, when things are unstable, are they in balance are they, or are they unbalanced? Unbalanced, of course. So you can link these two if, you, if we translate anicca and dukkha in that way. They're very, very linked. And sometimes I would read the Anatalakana Sutta and think, uh, well, the Buddha is saying, oh, monks, if things are, if form is impermanent, is it happiness or suffering? Well, suffering. But with those translations, I thought, how is he linking? Yeah, I can kind of see it, but how is he linking suffering with impermanence? And my mind wasn't quite connecting with it. But if I translate it as instability, yes, instability, if something is unstable, how could it be said to be balanced? How could it be said to be true so if it's unstable yes of course it's out of balance it's not balanced if it's not balanced how could it be said to be is it self or not self so when we think of atta and anatta so self when i think of what a self should be it should be like a firmly planted pillar of light that doesn't move or something that is very true and stable so if something is unstable and out of balance of course it can't be considered to be me or mine so sometimes looking at it from a, from different angles can be very helpful because uh, 
most of us here are quite sincere and we can take a lot of the teachings on faith. Well, if it's impermanent, yes, it's suffering, but then do we really penetrate the meaning of that? So looking into the penetrative meaning of these basic teachings is quite important. And we make an effort to understand. When we practice for a long time and we, we uh, meditate together, it's quite a blessing we can meditate together day in and day out and do the practice. And sometimes the mind might be peaceful, sometimes it's not peaceful. But when we practice for a long time, we keep precepts for a long time, we practice meditation for a long time, and we do this day in and day out, and uh, it's normal for the mind to start to default to old habits or attitudes, ways of viewing ourselves in the world. And it's always going to default back to that ita ramana, anita ramana. I want it to be good all the time. I want it to be, I want to be having fun all the time. I never want to be not having fun. I want to have pleasure all the time. And with the meditation, it should be pleasant all the time. It says so in the text. It says the uh, you know, Venerable Sariputta can enter any of the jhanas at will, anytime he wants. I should be able to do that. I should be able to have, I should be able to be peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud and demanding in nature all the time. So we, we have these ideals, and but it just it's falling back into seeing things in terms of ita ramana and anita ramana, wanting things to be good all the time, never wanting things to be bad. And it just can't be that way because the, the worldly dhammas define each other and gain defines loss. So if we think of gain, when we gain good things, we feel happy when we gain good things. When we gain good things, though, good things get used up get caught, get offered the best coffee in the world, it gets used up, uh, get offered something very expensive, even if it doesn't get used, it degrades, or we forget about it, it gets stored away, we get a new car, it starts degrading, even uh, when we start to really notice impermanence and instability and uncertainty everywhere, we can be even riding in a plane and notice the degradation of the seat in front of us. We might notice how it's not brand new, it's older. If it's an older airplane, or if we ride on public transport, it might be the same. Well, these things, they were new at one point, and then they're degrading. Or even this building, this building, it's still considered new, but it's already degrading. And it's uh, that's just the nature of things. That's how things work. This building is new and yet it's riddled with holes from the woodpeckers. So it's, it degrades, it can degrade very quickly. It's, it's not even that many years old and already that degradation has occurred and that's completely normal. So if we want to just have gain, we can't have gain without having loss. And there's not gonna be just loss either. We might feel like we only get loss, but we're gaining things too. And if we if we contemplate loss or if we learn how to be okay with it, then we gain wisdom. We gain wisdom from that. If we even gain some sort of pleasure, if we gain pleasure or happiness, then that changes. That's the instability of, the, of happiness. So if we gain some sort of pleasure or happiness, even if it's in meditation, if it's great contentment, great happiness in the meditation, then it changes. And when it changes, then if there's clinging to it, then we're, we'll suffer over it. So the happiness just changes into, it, it's out of balance. It changes into dissatisfaction. That's just ordinary. These things define each other. The happiness defines suffering. So if we have some sort of good reputation, status, we gain some sort of good reputation through our acts of generosity, or as monastics, we might gain a good reputation through our practice. We might be good at giving Dhamma talks and gain a good reputation due to that. And then that changes. You know, people's 
inclinations change, what people want to hear in a Dhamma talk changes, the society changes. And so there's status and there's loss of status. And that fame or, or having status might seem like a good thing because we get given more things. We might have more friends, but then it changes. It changes. We have friends and we lose friends. It says in one text that I've read, friends one moment, enemies the next. This is the nature of samsara. It's a quote from the seventh Dalai Lama. Friends one moment, enemies the next. Never have I found a constant friend. This is the nibbida. This is the world weariness that we cultivate through seeing the ita ramana, anita ramana, the nature of samsara. Seeing it clearly, seeing it truly. That there's gain and loss, fame and disrepute, you know, pleasure and pain, praise and blame. We want to, so we get praised, and it might be very genuine, but then the praise defines the criticism. Criticism defines the praise. So these things, these conditions, they're quite arbitrary. And in the Dhamma, in the Dhamma Vinaya, when the Buddha would criticize people or you would have the monks, the senior monks criticize or uh, give pointing out instructions to the newer monks. It would be supposed to be given for their benefit. But criticism, even when given for one's benefit, is still hard to bear. And uh, in the teachings it says the, the Buddha teaches in a couple different ways. He teaches in a pleasant way and an unpleasant way. How does the Buddha teach in a pleasant way? The Buddha teaches in a pleasant way by saying, do this, do that. He teaches in an unpleasant way by saying, don't do this, don't do that. So it's just our nature. We don't like to be told, don't do this, don't do that. You know, something, I may have done something and then get told, don't do that. And I've already done it, so then I feel terrible about it. And yet it may even be for my benefit. And so, And this is just the nature of people. It doesn't matter if we're... Americans or Thai or whatever country we're from, people just don't like to be criticized. And it's completely normal. So we, we will tend to say uh, people who end up teaching for a long time, you end up, I've been uh, reading some more of Lung Ban's teachings and it seems to be a theme or a thread through his teachings saying you have to teach yourself have to criticize yourself. See when you're doing things that might be antithetical to the practice or causing yourself suffering. So, and he's teaching from a place of having been a teacher for a very, very long time. And so this is a pattern with teachers. They don't want to criticize people because it's so hard for people to be criticized. So as teachers, we don't want to criticize anybody. And so we, we say, you have to encourage yourself. You have to see where you're making your own mistakes. Teach yourself, encourage yourself, because uh, the teachers will end up being what we call grangjai, not wanting to put people out, not wanting to make people feel bad. Um, if a teacher has a lot of compassion, though, they don't care about making you feel bad. They make you feel bad because they don't want you to fall to the lower realms of existence. They don't want you to fall into suffering. So it's out of compassion. But uh, that's a rare type of person who can do that. You know, somebody like, you should read the teachings of Ajahn Mahabua where he just, you know, he, he, just had, he just would have to say it and it's for people's benefit. It's hard to do. So for most of us, we say, you have to teach yourself. You have to see it for yourself. You know, the teachers aren't always going to tell you. You, know, you have to end up telling yourself. Or a teacher might tell you once or twice, and uh, you might think, well, eh, I don't agree. That's, that's not right. So, so in the end, we're always teaching ourselves anyway. Uh, one thing I'm learning as a, as a teacher Having, having been ordained for 21 years and still trying to learn how to be a teacher and uh, seeing the brilliance of a lot of the ways the Buddha taught. One thing I've 
I tend to do is I tend to say something once and I feel like, okay, I've done my duty. I've said it once and then I'm just going to let go whether people do it or not. It's up to them. But the Buddha didn't do that. The Buddha said it three times. So, okay, I'm learning that now. Or like making an announcement. I'll make an announcement once and uh, feel like, okay, that's enough. But now I, but then I realize, oh, I have to make an announcement three times and then most people will have heard it after the third time. <laughs> after one time, you know, maybe maybe one third of the community will have heard it, and after two times, two thirds will have heard it, and three times, maybe almost everybody, almost a hundred percent of everybody will have heard it. So the Buddha was brilliant in this, as in the Padimoka too. It's the for for a first time, has anybody committed these offenses? For a second time, for a third time, okay. So uh, it's, uh, it's to be understood that if something is announced three times, at least uh, you will get everybody's attention for at least one of those announcements. So this is a path of, of learning. It's a path of learning. How, would, how do we look using these basic frameworks in order to see our experience? The ita ramana, anita ramana, anicca dukkha anatta, and looking at our experience based on these things. And uh, we really have to practice. We really have to practice and be thinking and considering, thinking about and considering the Dhamma throughout the day, considering these teachings throughout the day. You know, how are we acting throughout the day outside of our meditation practice that is stoking the fires of this Ita Ramana and Anita Ramana. How are we acting throughout the day where it's like in the Dhamma Chaka Pawatana Sutta, Tatra Tatra Abhinandini, seeking fresh delight now here, now there. How is that playing out throughout the day? And that at the end of the day, before we go to bed, before we go to sleep, before we take a rest, can we reflect on these things and take stock of our day each day? Like, okay, well, what did I do today? Not, not in a way that's condemning of ourselves, but in a way that's, oh, what did I do that was wholesome and unwholesome today? What did I do that was skillful and unskillful? Uh, how was the mind going towards gain and being repelled by loss? Uh, was there, or was there any way of thinking or acting or speaking today that caused, caused me suffering? or that I didn't feel so good about, and to take stock of that. And, uh, and if we want, we can even try to, uh, we can bow before our personal shrine in our dwelling place and, and just ask forgiveness from the, the Buddhas and any, any forces of goodness, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to sleep better. And then that's how we make each day into a Dhamma practice. I would make make each day, each day into a dhamma practice, and and then when each day is brought into the practice, throughout the day, then that becomes a dhamma life, day after day of practice, then we have a dhamma life, and then, we have, a life that's, not just worth living, but we have a life that is, that is fulfilling, and we will be getting something we'll be making something of it. It'll have meaning when we look into these things. So to cultivate this ha these habits, when we recollect these things and cultivate these habits during the winter retreat, then if we're sincere, then it'll just carry over after the winter retreat because we will have created those wholesome habits and they don't just, they don't just stop. You know, when we create these wholesome habits and wholesome momentum, and that's going to keep going after the retreat. So that's something we can be cultivating right now. And at the end of the day, if we think of things we may have done or mistakes we may have made, uh, to be very forgiving of ourselves and of others, and to be willing to also acknowledge successes, times we were able to let go of anger, times we were able to be kind with ourselves or others. Uh, we may have had some success in our metta practice, we may have uh, cultivated some sort of generosity that was difficult, gone against tiredness in order to do something for somebody else. 
Uh, we can actually, it's appropriate and praised by the Buddha to delight in those things. And to keep all these things in mind, it does take some focus. That's another aspect of the meditation. And um, it takes some perseverance, it takes some focus, it takes mindfulness. We, we can't, if we get too distracted, we aren't gonna be able to keep these things in mind. So mindfulness is holding these things in mind. This is fourth Satipatthana. The Buddha gives us all these different sets of dhammas that we can actually use as a basis for our mindfulness. Four Noble Truths is one of those. You know, we can use any of these as a basis for our mindfulness. So there's a, there's a lot to look into. There's a lot we can realize about ourselves with the Dhamma practice. And, and uh, for tonight, I think that's probably uh, good enough for a, a brief Saturday night talk, and I think I'll just leave it there. <laughs>